Well, welcome everybody. Today is part two of Paleo Plus. This is Valerie Burke, and we did uh, the first part a week ago. If you missed that, you can view it on Harmony Hill's webinar site. And I'd like to thank Harmony Hill for this wonderful series of educational webinars that they've been doing, uh, especially focusing on nutrition, which is so important. Um, so anyway, last week we covered some of the background information about the paleo diet and why modern American diets are not working so well for us. We looked at how, you know, basically with the modern food, especially processed food, is destroying our health by creating all sorts of inflammation in our bodies and wreaking havoc with our metabolic hormones, like leptin and uh, you know, those sorts of things, insulin, especially with respect to refined carbohydrates and sugar. And um, we discussed a couple of the damaging dietary myths that are still out there and that have been making people sick for decades. So in this part, we're going to take a closer look at what comprises the ancestral or paleo diet, at least the principles of that diet, including protein and the importance of fat, particularly the right kind of fat. How much fat should, be we, should we be eating and how much protein should we be eating? And we're going to look a little more at some of the specific food groups what's good about them and what's not so good about them, including grains and legumes, potatoes, dairy, vegetables, salt, and fermented foods. And we'll look at how you can maybe incorporate a few of these principles into your diet. Uh, you know, whether you're a vegetarian, um, we'll look at, oh, maybe we could do this as a vegan, maybe not, and how we can incorporate all of this into our lives in a way that's kind to ourselves and, you know, low in stress and planet-friendly. Okay, so there we are back at the caveman again. So just a real quick refresher of where we left off last time with our preferred paleo food list. You can eat all the vegetables that you want, roots, like nut, you know, roots would be potatoes and uh, beets and carrots and things like that, nuts and seeds, meats, and low glycemic fruits and low glycemic because we want to stay away from things that are really loaded with sugar. So these are basically what our hunter-gatherer ancestors ate. And what they didn't eat, basically, were grains, legumes, dairy, and salt, although I'm going to toss in uh, some debate about the salt uh, aspect. Refined sugars, of course, because it was before agriculture and refined vegetable oils, which are so damaging to us, and fatty meats. And uh, the, the meats that, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're choosing fatty meats or lean meats because if you're choosing grass-fed, grass-pastured meats, they're going to be naturally lower in fat. Okay, so let's start with grains and legumes. And why, why did this cause, why has this caused us a problem with agriculture? Well, like we talked about last time, grains were just too darn hard to eat for our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Yet you had to smash them or soak them or do all kinds of things to them. They couldn't just be wandering around and putting them in their mouths you know, right out of the ground. It was too hard. So agriculture brought grains and beans, and those foods are just not something that we digest very well. And part of the reason for that is they contain something called anti-nutrients. What's an anti-nutrient? Well, it's a compound that interferes with the absorption of nutrients across the wall of your intestine, so from your gut into your bloodstream. Humans and mammals have digestive enzymes, uh, digestive systems that don't work properly to break these things down. And they have excessive calories. Most grains are just loaded with calories. And they're loaded with toxins, but I'm not talking just about man-made ones. I'm talking about the kind of toxins produced by the plants themselves. And the most well-known grain toxin is gluten. Gluten comes from the word glue because of its glue-like properties. And what it does is it interferes with the breakdown and absorption of nutrients and other foods in that meal. So you end up with this sticky glutinous gut bomb instead of a well-digested meal. Modern wheat and other grains are very different than the wheat that grew hundreds or even thousands of years ago because we've, we've um, hybridized these grains. They're higher in gluten. 
And so even the grains that they did happen to consume back then in very small quantities were much lower in gluten than the ones today that we're cultivating. So another anti-nutrient is lectin. You may have heard of lectin. It's a, a protein. Plants produce many kinds of lectins. It's a whole category. And these serve to ward off natural enemies like fungi and insects and us humans. So lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins that are widespread in the plant kingdom. They hook up with carbohydrates and they trigger inflammation. And they also trigger immune responses and raise your blood viscosity. And all of these things can predispose you to health problems and illnesses. Wheat lectin or wheat germ agglutinin, which is abbreviated WGA, is a pro-inflammatory, immunotoxic, neurotoxic, cardiotoxic, toxic in every other way substance to your cells. And what it can do is lead to cell death. And it's actually highest in whole wheat, uh, especially sprouted whole wheat, believe it or not. Um, and it has properties in the body very much like a virus. But both legumes and grains contain lectins, and it makes them hard to digest. So we're talking about beans and peas and lentils and peanuts and soybeans and rice, uh, spelt and rye as well. Legumes also contain phytoestrogens. And what these are is a weak hormone mimic that can interfere with your hormone function because your body can't tell it apart from the natural hormones that, are, that it makes. Plants develop these to disrupt the reproductive success of predators. That makes perfect sense when you think about it. But here's an interesting fact. White rice is less allergy triggering than brown rice because the hull has been removed and the toxins are in the exterior hull. Think protective armor. It makes sense for the plant to put it there because that's the part of the, the plant that the animal or predator is gonna come into contact with first. Every plant has to deal with being eaten by something and this is their best defense. If you were here last week, you, you saw my little cartoons, and it occurred to me since then that it feels like I'm sitting here talking to my computer because I can't hear any of you. I can't see any of you, and I was thinking, no one's laughing at my jokes. Well, that's because no one is laughing at my jokes that I can hear. So hopefully you appreciate them. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about fat. One of my favorite topics. Your body actually really needs fats, and it's a very underappreciated um, nutrient. As we talked about last time, it's excess carbohydrates that are the root cause of obesity and weight gain, not good fats. Modern studies, many of them are actually showing that fat lowers your risk for heart disease as opposed to raising it. Your brain is made up mostly of fat especially saturated fats and cholesterol. But, but there's a lot of things that fats do in your body. Brain function, regulating protein pathways in your cells, getting calcium uh, transported into your bones, building cell membranes, which are largely composed of fat, making hormones, uh, it's, um, fats are important to your immune system, proper nerve signaling, liver and lung health, healthy skin and hair, reducing hunger, they keep you uh, from getting hungry too quickly, slowing down absorption, gene regulation, and heart health. So your body needs fats. And our, our records show that early humans consumed a fair amount of fat, and yet they didn't get obese, they were in great physical shape, and the health problems that we see today were rare to non-existent thousands of years ago. A diet that skimps on healthy saturated fats robs your brain of the raw materials it needs to function it to its best. In fact, there is evidence now suggesting Alzheimer's disease is actually related to insulin resistance. And by some, it's even being called type 3 diabetes. <laughs> Having been owned by cats for many years, uh, I really love this one. Unfortunately, our beloved companions are getting fat and uh, sick for the same reasons that we are. 
one of the problems of the fats that we eat today is that our fatty acid ratios are upside down. We are eating way too many of the wrong kinds and not enough of the right kind. It's the type of fat that matters, not the amount of fat. Our ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids should be about 1 to 1 to 1 to 2, roughly the same amount of each. But today, the average American diet contains 1 to 10 or 1 to 20, so way too many omega-6s. And where are they coming from? Coming from vegetable oil like sunflower oil, safflower oil, soybean oil, corn oil, cottonseed, shortening and margarine, those kinds of things. The problem is omega-6 fats that we're eating so many of are, are pro-inflammatory, and a lot of the diseases that we're developing are inflammation-based. Omega-3 fats are anti-inflammatory, and we're not getting enough of those. The highest quality omega-3s come from, from animal products like egg yolks from pastured hens, so it gives them the deep golden color, pasture-raised meat, and fatty fishes. So just how much has our omega-6 fat intake increased? This is pretty startling. It's just totally off the chart. So since uh, 1909, about 100 years, our vegetable oil consumption has gone up by 459%. Salad and cooking oil, 1,340%. That's hard to even say. Margarine is up by 488%. Shortening, 237%. So all of these vegetable oils are heavy with omega-3 and light on omega, or I mean, I'm sorry, heavy with omega-6 and light in omega-3. So it's no wonder that our fatty acid profiles are upside down and we're all inflamed. So omega-6 fats should be balanced out with an equal amount, at least, of animal-derived omega-3 fats. These things like salmon, egg yolks, pasture-raised meat, krill oil. I'll be talking about krill oil here shortly. And you want to make sure that uh, the oils that you eat are fresh because if they're not, then they can oxidize and then it, it does you no good to eat them. In fact, you're actually taking in toxic substances when they become oxidized. It isn't that olive oil and walnut oil and avocado oil are bad for you. You just have to make sure that, that you're eating enough omega-3s to balance them out. So what are the good fats? Meats from pastured animals, grass-pastured animals. Organic egg yolks from grass-pastured hens. Raw organic milk, butter, ghee, and cream from grass-pastured cows and goats. Ghee is just basically clarified butter. Coconuts and coconut oil, palm oil, avocados, olives and olive oil, raw nuts and unheated organic nut oil because heat will oxidize them, and cacao butter, believe it or not. The bad fats are the processed ones. Corn oil, soy oil, canola, safflower, sunflower, peanut, ground fat, of course. Okay. So let's take a look at how much protein and how much fat, because this is an area where a lot of people get confused uh, when starting out on a paleo-type diet. And there's a lot of um, misunderstandings. A lot of people think paleo is about meat with a side order of meat and meat for dessert. And it, it really is, it can be loaded with too much protein. So a typical paleo dieter consumes about 38% protein, 39% fat, 23% carbs. But this is actually too much protein for most of us. The optimal amount for most people, unless you're pregnant or you're an Olympian athlete, is about 35 to 70 grams per day of protein. So an easy formula for calculating your protein requirement is to take your body fat, so percent body fat, subtract it from 100, and then the result you get is your lean body mass percentage. So you take that lean body mass times your weight, and this gives you lean body mass in pounds. Divide that number by two, and this gives you an approximate grams of protein per day. So you need about a half gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. 
more than this can cause problems with your health, and that's not what you're trying to do. That's what you're trying to resolve with doing a paleo diet. The optimal amount of fat in your diet, that was protein, so now we're moving to fat, is 50 to 75% of your diet, as I think I mentioned last week. It can be even higher than that if you have a lot of health problems. Fat can be very healing to the body, very nourishing. The paleo diet is about 23% carbs, typically. That's kind of an average. And you, want to, you might want to take this even lower in carbs if you have insulin problems or leptin resistance or you know, metabolic dysfunction. But you don't want to replace those calories with protein. You want to replace them with fats. The good fats, of course. So we're talking avocados and ghee and coconut oil, raw nuts and eggs. These are a much better source of fuel, especially if you have chronic health problems or you're metabolically challenged. And so you might have to tweak it a little bit depending on how you feel. Always listen to your body. Um, you can vary these ratios a little bit and, and see how you do. Your body is going to have to learn how to burn fat again versus carbohydrates because generally we've been eating so many more carbohydrates that we've shut down that fat-burning engine. And it's like anything else. It has to learn how to do that. So there are biochemical shifts that your body will go through. A little experimenting is in order. So all that said, shoot for about 15% protein, 60% fat, 25% carbs. Ballpark numbers. Okay, what about fish? Well, fish used to be the best source of omega-3 fatty acids, but unfortunately, um, labs all over the world are, are showing us that almost all fish is contaminated with mercury and heavy metals and toxins, thanks to how much we've polluted the, the world. So it's, it's probably best to limit your fish consumption. Even the FDA has acknowledged that mercury is a concern, and they've gone as far as recommending pregnant women limit their fish consumption to twice a week. But I think it probably needs to be extended to everybody. If you do eat fish, make sure it's wild caught, not farmed, ideally tested for mercury. There are companies who will test it. Vital Choice, for example, is one of them. And salmon and sardines are generally the uh, safest varieties of fish because they're smaller. Um, salmon can be cont contaminated. You want to make sure it's not farmed. And make sure you're not eating uh, larger fish like halibut and swordfish because mercury is concentrated up the food chain. So the larger a fish is, the longer it lives, the higher it is in toxins generally. And it can be as high as a thousand-fold higher. An alternate to eating uh, fish is taking a krill oil supplement. And, and this is my favorite, uh, thanks to Dr. Mercola, my favorite source of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it's widely available now, has really, you know, come to most uh, nutrition store shelves over the past couple years. It's um, got advantages of being mercury-free because krill are very tiny, sustainable, planet-friendly. It's actually the largest biomass on the planet, and it's 20 times more potent than fish oil. A number of reasons for that that are more than I want to take time to go into. But another advantage to the krill is it, is it goes into your brain versus only into your heart. It can cross that blood-brain barrier. So it's wonderful for brain health. And it's strongly anti-inflammatory. It puts any anti-inflammatory drug to shame and has no side effects. So if you have arthritis or asthma, um, this, is, this is your guy, the krill oil. Good stuff. <laughs> I have that problem. Just kidding. Okay, what about dairy? Dairy is not on the traditional paleo diet. It's a paleo purist, you know, avoid dairy altogether. But this is where I'm going to suggest that maybe you might want to bend the rules a little bit because dairy can be a good, a very good way to uh, increase your good fats and, and a lot of other things, especially if you're a vegetarian, which we'll talk about in a bit. And it, but it depends on how you tolerate it. 
Some people don't tolerate it. Um, for, some, for some folks, the glycemic index of milk, even though it's relatively low, the sugar in milk will cause an insulin spike. And then some people can't tolerate the casein, which is a milk protein. Others can't tolerate lactose, which is one of the milk sugars. And then there's the pasteurization issue, which pasteurization, because it's heat, it alters the proteins and makes them foreign to your body. So when you look at health benefits of pasteurized milk versus raw milk, two completely different things. And uh, pasteurized milk is classic for causing allergies. So pasteurization is not needed if your milk comes from properly raised cows. If you're getting your milk from large dairy operations, factory farms, it has to be pasteurized because these animals are so prone to disease from the terrible living conditions, you know, they're packed by the hundreds, if not thousands, into buildings. They're not roaming on pasture. And so their milk is full of bacteria and antibiotics and growth hormones and pus, and so they have to pasteurize it to make it safe. But if you get your, your raw milk from an organic, uh, a small organic local farm that has its animals roaming on pasture, you don't have all those diseases. And you get all the health benefits with none of the downside. The absolute best uh, dairy products that you can eat are for fermented organic dairy. This would be things like uh, yogurt, homemade yogurt is best, raw cheese, kefir, things like that. And these are great sources of vitamin K2, whey protein, good fats, minerals, vitamins, and natural probiotics. By the way, did you hear about the study today? just came out, at least in terms of coming out in the media, about the low-fat dairy study and weight gain. They, the researchers were surprised to learn that people who consume low-fat dairy products gain more weight and more body fat than people who ate full-fat dairy, who were much leaner. And this was not only found amongst adults, but amongst children as well. So it didn't surprise me, but it definitely surprised uh, some of the researchers. Okay, speaking of fermented, if you can't tolerate dairy, then eat fermented vegetables. And, and our hunter-gatherer predecessors indeed did consume fermented foods. Today, the Inuit up in Alaska cache their meat and consume it rotted. The hunter-gatherers harvested tubers and roots, ground them up, buried them, and left them to ferment. Scavenging uh, for the hunter-gatherers included eating fruits that had fallen off of trees and nuts that were covered in wild yeast from the ground. And so they had a steady supply of natural probiotics that we don't naturally get. Naturally fermented vegetables and dairy, if you tolerate dairy, are good sources of probiotic organisms, which are so important for your immune health because 80% of our immune system starts in the gut. So things like sauerkraut, naturally fermented pickles, not the kind that are in vinegar, but the kind that are, are tart from the natural uh, bugs in there, kimchi, all are excellent sources of natural probiotics. You can take a probiotic supplement. You can get them in, at many places, but you just, just realize that there's no substitute for the real thing. There, when you eat it in a food, it's much more potent um, than in a, in a supplement. So the more of these foods you can get into your diet on a regular basis, the better. So did you know you're only one-tenth human? Your body contains 100 trillion microorganisms weighing about three pounds. So that's more than 10 times the number of human cells you have in your body. So we're all walking zoos. Did you know you have two brains? This is pretty interesting. Um, one in your head and one in your gut. They've been finding that our intestines and are producing a lot of the chemicals that we thought were relegated to the realm of brain cells. And so you, your mental health is actually as much controlled by your gut as your brain. Very interesting research here. 
80% of your immune system is in your gut, and it just won't function right unless your gut flora is in balance. If it gets out of balance, then you can get something called leaky gut syndrome, which is where particles from your digestive tract that aren't broken down properly pass through the wall of your gut and into your bloodstream. And this can trigger allergies, inflammation, and it's a major factor underlying all sorts of diseases from diabetes to psychological and neurological disorders, possibly to autism, heart disease, and many others. What are the symptoms of leaky gut? Well, kind of the traditional gas, bloating, constipation, nausea, headaches, sugar craze. But it could also, you know, you might not have those symptoms and you might just have, um, you know, allergies or, or inflammation going on that you're not, you haven't tied it to your gut. Lots and lots of studies showing how helpful probiotics can be for all sorts of different problems. You simply will not get well without healing and sealing your gut. I can't stress that enough. One of the people that, made, that has made the largest contribution in this area is Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. She's a Russian neurologist who had an autistic child. She realized that she really couldn't help her child from what she knew in her field, so she went back to school for a degree in nutritional science. And she's treated, not only did she cure her own child of autism, but she's treated many, many, many uh, severely ill children, children and adults with the diet that she came up with, which is called the GAPS diet. Gut and psychology syndrome is what it originally uh, was coined for. So I've read her book and I've listened to several interviews and I really, really uh, gained an appreciation for the importance of healing and sealing your gut so much that I devoted a whole chapter to it in my book. There are several interviews on Mercola.com that you can listen to or you can just probably put in her name and Google it and and she does have a very strong uh, Russian accent, so sometimes it's, it's a challenge to understand her, but she really, really knows her stuff. Okay. So it's time to pause and see if anybody has any questions. I'll come up for air here for a moment. Any questions, anybody? In my windows. For some reason, my the PowerPoint screen doesn't stay fixed when I try and look at the screens for you. Okay, so Lisa. Lisa, your hand is up, but I'm not able to unmute you. So can I ask you to actually um, type your question into your chat window. In the meantime, uh, Sandra is, is asking me, what was the name of the last author? Uh, Nat Natasha Campbell McBride. She's Russian, but I believe she has a practice in um, the UK. Okay, Karen, um, how to compromise? Yes, um, she eats some dairy, some yogurt, has some sugar, dark chocolate. I think this is, I think this is excellent. I, I think that you have to uh, eat some of those foods that you do enjoy, and um, if you're not having a problem with, with dairy, then go for it. I think it can be very, very good nutritious thing. Sugar, I talked a lot about sugar last time. Just keep track of your, your you know, grams of sugar per day and, and try to keep it under 25, you know, 25 grams or so. Dark chocolate, the higher, higher percentage of chocolate, the darker, the better, and make sure it's organic. So uh, it's all about juggling it, and it's so important to do it in a way that doesn't stress you out. So if you're doing paleo and it's stressing you out, then you're not going to get the health benefits. You're just going to get stressed. And stress causes hormonal imbalance. And, and then when your hormones get messed up, your metabolic hormones also get messed up. So you're not doing yourself any favors. 
have a question about canola oil. Um, avoid it. Not a good idea. It's a processed oil, so it's, it's mostly omega-6s, and uh, it's not on a good list, a list of good oils. Um, you always want non-GMO, regardless of you know whether you're whatever food it is. Yes, you want to look for non-GMO. Um, does paleo allow barbecue sauce and other sauces? Well, if they come out of a bottle, chances are they're mostly sugar. If you're making them yourself, um, then you're then you can control what goes into it. So I would say, um, yeah, just. Be, be careful, attention to the ingredients. The other issue with barbecue sauce or anything out of a bottle is MSG can be hiding in there. And sometimes it's just in food, you know, like caramel coloring. So the more chemicals that are in there, the more your, your body is going to have opportunities to react to something. So basically for, for paleo, you're going to want to Make a lot of things from scratch. Shop around the perimeter of the grocery store. And, and the fewer things that you consume out of a can, a bottle, or a box, the better. Let's see. Any other questions? I think I've got them all there. OK. Ah, see, now I've lost my, my place. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on to potatoes, one of my favorite topics. Never met a potato I didn't like, unfortunately. This is where you can play with your carbohydrate ratios a little bit. If, if you feel like, if you're if you're a carbohydrate addict and making the switch to paleo is making you feel a little sick or, you know, low on energy or whatever, um, you know, you can add in a potato. At least that's better than sugar or crackers. Um, so your diet should be low in carb but not no carb. Most pe people do better with some starchy carbohydrates in their diet. The sweet spot appears to be about 20 to 30 percent carbs. And it doesn't have to be potatoes. It can be carrots, beets, squash. Those things all have sugars in there that are going to, you know, give you the quick energy. Some people have digestive issues around starch. So if you're one of them, potatoes are not going to be your friend. There are something that, you know, depending on which scientist you ask, there are some safe starches, or some starches are safer than others. Which ones are safe? Well, there are multiple answers there. So let me just give you some information, and then you can kind of juggle it in your own mind. Um, the true paleo purists give the thumbs up to yams and sweet potatoes, and the thumbs down to white potatoes. But sweet potatoes and yams are loaded with sugar. So paleo purists, you know, I think that we have to take a look at what the research says about all the damage that sugar is doing in our bodies. And given that bit of information, perhaps white potatoes aren't so bad because they are lower in the sugar. Most of what's marketed today as a yam is really just another variety of sweet potato. And this picture is what a true yam looks like. And when's the last time you saw one of those on your grocery store shelves? Probably not. So I'm of the opinion that sweet potatoes really don't have that much of an advantage over white potatoes due to that sugar content, especially if you have metabolic issues. And, you know, if you have insulin problems, then you're going to want to avoid potatoes altogether because they, they will spike your insulin. Sweet potatoes today are bred for high sugar content. Um, some of them are hundreds of times higher than they used to be. Okay. Oh, and by the way, before I get into salt, uh, metabolically speaking, you could argue that potatoes are actually safer than fruit because the kind of sugar that they contain is glucose versus fructose. And like we talked about in part one, glucose can be used by every single cell in your body, whereas fructose has to be broken down exclusively by your liver. So it's a much much worse load on the liver 
And just a little bit of trivia, the plant toxins, yes, potatoes have toxins also, are in the peel. So ideally, you should peel your potatoes before eating them. Remember the protective armor. Okay, so Dr. Cordain is pretty much anti-salt, which is interesting because salt is an essential nutrient required for a lot of things. Um, some of those things are blood pressure regulation and transportation of nutrients in and out of your cells, ion exchange, and the communication between your brain and your muscles. So de decades of scientific research have failed to show the benefits of a low-salt diet. And in fact, some are showing the opposite. There are studies showing that low-salt diets are associated with higher cardiac risk, not lower. The primary study responsible for the sodium myth didn't control for fructose consumption. So sugar was the real culprit, but salt was blamed. Chemical salt and natural salt are not the same thing. Chemical salt is junk food, basically. There's a world of difference between the two. So it's just like the difference between refined sugar and the sugar in a piece of fruit. Chemical salt is simply laboratory manufactured sodium chloride, whereas natural sea salt has less sodium and instead is full of dozens of other minerals, all that do great things in your body. Some of them are trace minerals that you get in very few sources. So your salt, like all food, should be unprocessed and as natural as it can be, as natural as to how it formed on the earth as possible. And if you eliminate processed food, you'll be eliminating most of the sodium, the bad kind of salt. So, you know, you, you then can be free to add as much sea salt to your, your dinner as possible as you want. Did our ancestors eat salt? Well, yes, they did. Organized here. Okay. Yes. So some of the Paleolithic people lived near the ocean, and they did things like cooking the seawater and sprinkling their food with dry sea salt. And then inlanders did things like drinking the blood of animals, which was a concentrated source of salty minerals, eating bones, making bone broths, and sprinkling salt-rich clay minerals on their food. The other thing is the wild forage greens that they were hunting and gathering, gathering were a lot higher in salt and minerals than our supermarket stuff. You know, we've, our soils are so depleted now that they don't offer us all of these nutrients that we used to have. And so I really think that uh, natural sea salt is an important part of the diet, and there's no evidence to suggest that it's not. I also want to stay away from artificial sweeteners. Um, you want to stay away from artificial everything, but artificial sweeteners are extremely bad. And, you know, they range the whole gamut. Aspartame, Equal, Splenda, Saccharin, of course, all of them. Want to avoid concentrated forms of fructose. Most common one is high fructose corn syrup. And honey is a good option for natural sweeteners. Um, you just still have to pay attention to moderation because it's a fairly rich source of carbohydrates and sugar. Stevia you can use with reckless abandon. It's an herb. It doesn't spike your insulin. Um, has no health, you know, negative health effects to my knowledge. And so some of the other ones that you'll see are yacon syrup, maple syrup, uh, coconut syrup, coconut crystals, date sugar, and there's some other natural alter alternatives. So the closer you can find one that's, that's um, as unprocessed as possible, the better. MSG, of course, MSG is a nerve toxin, and it's hidden in a lot of processed foods. It you know, lurks in, on labels under names such as uh, hydrolyzed protein, yeast extract, yeast food, autolyzed yeast, textured protein, glutamate, gelatin. Apparently some gelatin has it in there. Soy sauce, malt flavoring, some broths. So, you know, again, you can read a label, but you can't necessarily tell what's hidden uh, within some of those chemicals that are listed on the label. Food coloring, don't need them. Anything you can't pronounce or recognize as a food. 
it's uh, best to stay away from. Okay. I don't know if any of you are vegetarians or vegans. I've done both for different periods of my life um, and trying to find something that worked for me. I never felt good on either of those diets, especially the vegan diet. Um, there are some challenges with specific types of nutrients, whether you're vegan or vegetarian, much more so if you're vegan. I don't know how you can do the paleo diet if you're vegan. I've thought about this quite a lot, and you can certainly employ principles of sustainability and eating close to the earth and avoiding polluted things and, and such. But unless you have some animal products in your diet, specifically the eggs and the dairy, I, I think you're going to be missing a lot of really important uh, nutrients. The first one is B12. B12 is almost exclusive to animal products. And you can be developing a B12 deficiency uh, for many years before it actually shows up. And by then, you're so depleted that it's, it's hard to turn it around. Another important one is sulfur. Sulfur containing amino acids and proteins come from animal foods, like grass-fed meat, eggs, raw milk. And the deficiency in sulfur increases your cardiac risk, increases problems for joints and muscles, risk for Alzheimer's, um, problems with insulin function and other things. So sulfur is a really important nutrient that um, is a challenge if you're not using animal foods. Glutathione. This is also related to sulfur, as the precursors come from animal-derived amino acids. This is your most important native antioxidant, but your body has to make it. You can't consume it. So you have to, have, you have to be getting enough of the raw materials in your diet. Cholesterol. Cholesterol is actually a very important fat for your health, and you can be uh, insufficient in your cholesterol and its building blocks, which can lead to problems with heart, brain, hormones. Um, high LDL is sometimes a sign of inadequate cholesterol, and it can lead to plaque formation in your arteries. We're talking about, you know, having enough cholesterol. Everybody talks about having too much, but uh, you know, cholesterol that isn't oxidized, the healthy kind of cholesterol is actually really important for your health. Vitamin K2 and vitamin A are, are two vitamins that are bioavailable only in animal products. Vitamin K2 is essential for strong bones and for clear arteries, keeping calcium from being deposited in your arteries and going to your bones instead where you want it. And then beta carotene, which some people think vitamin A and beta, beta carotene are the same thing, but they're not. They're different forms. And beta carotene is very poorly converted to vitamin A in the body. So you can get beta carotene from vegetables. But the true form of vitamin A is really only available from animal products. Soy is not a good protein substitute for a number of reasons. Remember, soy is a legume, a bean. And then we have digestive systems that are short and unable to efficiently digest cellulose, plant fiber. So eating more nutrient-dense foods like meat and animal fat allows our bodies to, to reserve some energy for other processes to take place, like detox. Anyway, I just it would be very difficult to try and do a paleo diet if you're a vegan. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be animal-friendly and planet-friendly when we embark on this adventure. Um, this is really near and dear to my heart. Paleo, I'm an animal lover. So paleo principles need to be in alignment with environmental sustainability and happy, healthy, kindly treated animals. So I think we need to make sure if we're going to be eating animal products, that we're supporting local farmers who raise their animals humanely and sustainably. Grass is the natural food for most of the animals that we eat. So by growing corn and wheat and soy, we're destroying those animals' natural feeding grounds. So we might be directly killing more animals by growing grain than by eating animals. Growing grains using monoculture, meaning vast fields of one uh, one product, like wheat or soy, is destroying our planet's topsoil. So biodynamic farms help build the soil instead of destroying it. 
removing animals from land accelerates these certifications. What about weight? If you're underweight or overweight, what about the paleo diet? Well, you don't have to count calories. You can forget about measuring portions or points. Forget about dieting per se. You just eat the right <laughs> foods in the right categories until you're satisfied. Remember that calorie is not a calorie. You know, your body treats carbohydrate calories different than fat calories. And you're going to be detoxifying by eating clean, nutritious foods. You're going to be letting go of, of that body fat and all the toxins that are held in it. It's about the quality of your food, not the quantity. So if you're eating a biologically appropriate diet, which paleo diet is biologically appropriate for human beings, this allows your body composition to normalize over time. And you can exercise until the cows come home. And if you're not giving your body the right fuel, you're not going to you're not going to achieve your, your goals. You're not going to be optimally healthy. <laughs> I just love that one. Not only do you have to eat like a caveman, you got to exercise like a caveman, too. So you'll optimize your metabolism by exercising in a way that triggers this primitive survival response. So think about fight or flight. Our ancestors got attacked by predators when they were doing things like eating and drinking and their heads were down and they weren't looking out to see who was coming around the bend. When confronted, they had to burst into action. And so this is the pattern that we want to replicate with our exercise routines. The most effective fitness programs involve 10 to 15 minute sessions of high intensity burst type intervals with strength training. And, you know, you only have to do these one or two days a week. That's the really good news. The primary goal is accomplished, which is quickly emptying out your glycogen stores. And this is, if you'll remember, it's your, the, the stored form of sugar. So what this does, when you empty out your glycogen stores, you're increasing your insulin sensitivity, which the flip side of that is you're decreasing insulin resistance. And then a whole cascade of positive metabolic changes start happening. Multiple studies are showing that this type of exercise is far more effective at building lean body mass, optimizing heart function, and mobilizing fat than traditional cardio. It's a lot easier on the heart as well. <laughs> I still don't hear anybody laughing. Okay. Intermittent fasting. This is, is something that has been uh, coming up a lot in the studies lately in fitness uh, fitness world um, as a way to help regulate blood sugar, stimulate growth hormone, which growth hormone, when we're children, helps us grow. But when we're adults, it helps our body repair and heal. So the more of it that our body produces, the faster we heal and the better we feel. Facilitates digestion. Uh, helps the body relearn how to burn fat for fuel because it's so used to burning carbohydrates. And so when you combine intermittent fasting with a high intensity burst type exercise plan, you're you're really accelerating all of these all of these things. So try exercising in a fasting state, meaning you know you don't have to fast for days. We're talking about just fasting, uh, you know, skip breakfast, exercise on an empty stomach before hitting the gym. Uh, you know, don't eat. And so we're talking fasting for 12 to 18 hours a few days a week. So have your dinner at 6 and, and don't have your, uh, your breakfast slash lunch until after you've done your workout. That's not an extreme form of fasting by any means. Important to avoid carbohydrates before and after you exercise because those inhibit your body's ability to burn fat during an exercise session. And carbs promote energy storage, whereas um, not energy burning. And you want to promote energy burning. And so then what you do is you, you have a recovery meal about a half an hour after your workout. And this should be ideally an easily assimilated protein, like a whey shake, you know, a good quality protein shake. 
fasting gives your body a break from having to process food so that more energy is available to do things like detoxify and repair tissues and other important processes. I think she looks kind of cute in the stripes myself. So like any new routine in your life, um, if you're going to start doing paleo, you have to plan ahead. This isn't a diet, it's, it's a lifestyle shift. And any lifestyle shift can't happen overnight, you know, you, without making yourself crazy anyway. So this is about gradually changing your body's physiology so that you'll be healthier for the rest of your life. So you don't want to start too quickly. You want to start slowly. You want to think ahead, think it through, think of how to implement it into your life. If you've been doing three meals a week at McDonald's for 20 years, you don't want to go full-on paleo all of a sudden because you're going to feel sick. So maybe start by reducing soda and sugar. Just like the person who asked me earlier, you know, what if, what if I want to have a piece of dark chocolate or some sugar? Well, have it. Um, make some gradual changes. Have a better type of chocolate. Maybe have raw chocolate and just cut down on your sugar. Maybe replace uh, something with a piece of fruit. Um, and then start limiting fast foods and processed foods and, and things that have chemicals in them. And then once you've got that kind of down, then start buying more organic stuff. Start reducing carbohydrates and grains. And this can occur over weeks or months. This just doesn't have to happen overnight. No paleo police are going to be knocking at your door, I promise. Develop a food routine. And this has to be a priority. And for most of us, it's kind of like the last thing that, that we think about. You know, it's like the least important thing. Well, I just got to eat something and get on with the important stuff. Wrong. Food is really crucial to how we feel and, and, and our health. Yeah, never leave home without a healthful snack. I guarantee you, if you're hungry while you're out running around, you'll probably pick up the first thing that looks good and it'll be evil. Trust me on this one. Stock your pantry with paleo staples. Raw nuts are a good one. Transition out of boxed anything. So, you know, fill your fridge with snacks like carrot sticks and maybe cooked chicken breasts. Um, you know, a, a nitrate-free beef jerky in the pantry is good. Sliced fruit. Um, the more you can put these things in your fridge that are all cleaned and sliced and ready to go, um, the more apt you will be to grab that instead of something that that uh, a convenience food. And do some cooking on your days off. Put some, some of this in the freezer so that when you're tired and get home from work and you don't feel like cooking, you have something that is quick and easy to fix for your family, you know, with no muss, no fuss. I love mason jars, and I make up, in fact, I did it today. I'm making a huge pot of um, bouillonnaise sauce, and... Uh, what I'll do is I'll put that in quart jars, uh, three or four jars, and put them in the freezer, and, and that makes a, a really good quick quick meal for later. You already know this one. Shop around the perimeter of your perimeter of your grocery store. That's where the whole food is. Be patient. Your body can't change overnight. It's all about being kind to yourself. Make sure you're getting plenty of fresh, pure water every day. Don't worry as much about exact quantity. Just drink enough that your urine stays very light yellow to nearly colorless, unless you're on B vitamins, and then it's going to be bright yellow, so you can't use that as a gauge. But, um, yeah, just make sure you're well hydrated. Plenty of sleep. Do something physical every day, even if it's just a brisk walk. Very important, manage your stress. My favorite tool is EFT, which stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques, or tapping. You might have seen people like tapping on their forehead, around their eye. This is a kind of acupuncture without needles, and it's my favorite stress reduction technique. So favorite that I became a certified EFT practitioner a few years ago. Um, you can learn it for yourself on the Internet. It's, it's not hard to learn. Even kids can learn it, and uh, so I highly recommend it. Be really picky about the supplements. Supplements are just that, supplements. They shouldn't replace your foods. 
and you should be as, as careful about the quality and source of your food as you are about supplements. So if you're not eating crap anymore, don't take crappy supplements. Get out in nature. Put your bare feet on the earth. This is called earthing, and it's actually one of the best antioxidant sources you can find. Our ancestors were in constant contact with the earth, and so they received a continuous flow of electrons, and we've lost that vital earth energy with our indoor living and, and rubber-soled shoes. And so now they've even got earthing pads that you can buy, that you can use in your home or at your desk, and it actually plugs into a grounding socket of the house, and you get a flow of, of electrons that come up from the earth, and um, they're wonderful. I have one on my feet when I'm sitting and writing at my desk. They really do work. <laughs> I hope this doesn't happen to you. Okay, so let's just summarize some basic paleo principles. Eat foods raised eat foods raised in accordance with their own natural environment. So the closer to nature, the better. Don't eat stuff that isn't food. Prepare your foods traditionally. Eat a lot of your foods raw. Eat your carbohydrate in accordance with your energy expenditure. So if you're sitting at a desk all day, you're not going to need to eat like you're an Olympic athlete. Eat fats with reckless abandon, and I don't have to remind you I'm talking about the good fats. Eat naturally fermented foods and make your own sauerkraut. That is, it's so good. You just wouldn't believe how good it is. I didn't even like regular grocery store sauerkraut, and I started making my own, and it's just a much, um, a much gentler tartness. It's just this pleasant tartness and almost like a fizzy, fizzy nature. It's just, it's delicious. Enjoy a wide variety of foods. Learn where your food comes from. Get to know your local farmers. Listen to your body and love your food. Okay, so the important part before we get into questions here is, is to make changes slowly, one thing at a time. You know, if you just can't give up that, I don't know, bowl of rice, don't not do the paleo diet because of that one thing. Just work around it. You know, a lot of cravings will go away over time when you start cleaning cleaning up your diet. Otherwise, you're likely to get overwhelmed, and this increases your odds of failing. Maybe all you want to do right now is cut back on sugar and processed foods. That's fine. Be gentle with yourself and decrease your stress. Don't increase it. Stress, stress elevates our sympathetic nervous system, and this shuts down your body's natural self-healing ability. So if you're doing this to get healthier, you're, it's not going to work if, you're, if you go about it in a way that you're getting really stressed. last thing you want to do is stress over your diet. We have enough to stress about without that. Okay. So let me get back to my little window where I can see if anybody has, uh, has questions. Okay, so it's kind of a long one here. I'm just going to read it. I have serious digestive issues, maybe leaky gut, need to learn more about it. My pills come out in my stool sometimes as they went in. Um, okay, and she lists a few different, uh, different things. Um, so loose stools from first thing in the morning. Um, Seems to stop late in the afternoon and evening. Seeing some allopathic specialist naturopath, doing acupuncture regularly, eat well daily, still too many carbs and sugar. Okay. You know, it might be helpful to pick up a copy of the GAPS diet. It's a very easy transition to go from GAPS to paleo. I did GAPS for three months and I had, I felt so good. And GAPS diet has, I don't remember, eight different stages. So you start with a very restricted approach and then you add foods in. So kind of like the elimination diet, you can 
tell when you're going to get into something that's going to cause problems. But the fact that you're having loose stools and lots of digestive problems um, says that you've probably got a digestive flora that's all upside down and backwards. And what my naturopath had me do was um, pick up a copy of the book and read it cover to cover and then decide whether I wanted to do it because it, there is a fair amount of work involved. You end up making bone broths <laughs> several times a week, you know, by in big batches because that's a, a core part of the GAPS diet, which I actually do to this day. I, I use bone broths um, practically every day. And then the fermented foods. Also, she stresses the fermented foods, uh, fermented cabbage. Probably if dairy, let's see, you've tried no dairy, no gluten, you might want to just stick with fermented vegetables. But anyway, I would, I would approach it from that standpoint and um, see if you can get a handle on it. That would be my recommendation. Okay. You are welcome. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, that's it from me. We actually finished almost on time. I want to thank you all for showing up tonight. It was great to have some people live for this. And um, hopefully you were able to follow along. I know I blew through quite a lot of a lot of stuff. Harmony Hill has all sorts of excellent webinars in their series, so I encourage you to go to their their site and check some of those out. Deanna Minnick is is wonderful. And if you'd like more information on my version of the Paleo Diet, this is my book. And as a gift to you for making it all the way to the end of this, I have made it so that you can download a free copy. Uh, of the ebook form on Amazon. So if you just go to Is the Paleo Diet Right for You page on Amazon uh, today through Valentine's Day, you can download this for free. So price is right. So thank you so much for attending and um, happy paleo eating. And uh, oh, and if you need to reach me, feel free to go to my website, ValerieBurke.net, and shoot me a, an email, and I do actually read them and get back to you. Thanks so much.